This video is a brief summary of the final preparation that you want to be doing on the morning of the GCSE Physics Paper 2 and also in the first five minutes of that exam to make you as successful as you possibly can be. By the time you get to Physics Paper 2, you've already done five other GCSE Science exams, so hopefully this is kind of old news. But you'll have noticed by now that you're being told to bring a black pen, a ruler, a protractor for physics and a scientific calculator. The black pen is because unlike your mock exams, this paper isn't going to be marked by somebody who's holding on to the whole thing. Instead, it's going to be scanned and black ink is much better at scanning than blue ink. The ruler is going to be particularly important in this paper because especially for the forces topic, you're likely to get questions where you need to draw vectors and just generally be able to measure things. Likewise, the protractor is going to be really important for those forces questions. And the scientific calculator is, of course, important because in GCSE physics, 30 percent of the marks are for math skills. Now, when you go into that exam, you have 75 minutes for 70 marks or 105 minutes for 100 marks if you're doing the separate science exams. So basically you have a minute per mark, but you also have five minutes spare. And I would really recommend that you use those five minutes to get yourself in the best frame of mind. It can be really helpful to walk into the exam having a few key facts ready to write down regardless of what's on the exam paper. Partly because this is going to help you to remember those crucial pieces of information, but also because it means you start your exam really in control. You start your exam doing exactly what you plan to do, and that's going to help you to fight any feelings of rising panic or anxiety. For the physics exams, you do get an equation sheet, and particularly in 2022, you're going to get an even more extensive equation sheet than they've had in previous years. But remember, that equation sheet doesn't tell you absolutely everything that you need to know. So one quite useful thing to do at the start of the exam is to start off by annotating that equation sheet with a bit more information. For instance, the equation sheet gives you the equations, but it doesn't give you the units for all of the various quantities. So you can start off by writing down things like all of the energy quantities are measured in joules. Mass, of course, is measured in kilograms. Speed is measured in meters per second and height is measured in meters. It's really important that you're using the correct quantity when you're using these equations, because otherwise your answer could be out by several orders of magnitude. The other thing that it's really useful to do is to write down the rearranged versions of these equations. Now, some of these equations are quite straightforward and rearranging them is not going to be hard to do on the fly if you have good math skills. But some of them, like this kinetic energy equation, are just a little bit more complicated. And so you might find it easier to memorize the rearranged version of the equation and just quickly scribble that down on your equation sheet when the exam starts. You're going to have some room on the back of that equation sheet to write down a few key facts, either things that you've got wrong in the past and want to make sure you get right this time, or things that are just very, very likely to come up. I'd recommend only picking about five of them to write down, but I'm going to give you quite a few different ideas here for things that you might choose to include. Working scientifically skills are always a good place to start because they're very likely to come up across all six papers. So the first thing would be, what are the variables for an investigation? So I like to remember mixed dry, and this stands for we modify the independent variable, which goes on the X axis if we were to draw a graph. And then the dependent variable is the one that we record and it goes on the Y axis. Then our control variables are the things that we keep the same and force to stay the same and will not allow to change. So I always remind classes that I am a control freak. I always like to have my same seating plan. I always like to have the same lilac colored PowerPoint. And that's how I remember it. It's a good idea to have your unit conversions written down. And these are the same for every base unit. So it doesn't matter whether it's newtons or whether it's meters or whether it's grams. There are always a thousand milli in a just base, so a thousand millimeters in a meter, and there are always a thousand base in a kilo, and so on and so forth. You might want to remind yourself that when describing relationships, um, two quantities are directly proportional if when you double one, you double the other. It's not enough to just talk about them increasing. You could also say that if you plot them on a graph, it's not just a linear graph, but it's a linear graph that passes through the origin, it passes through zero, zero. You also might want to remind yourself that a systematic error is where a piece of equipment is out by the same amount every time. So, for instance, if you're measuring your mass on a balance and it's always giving you a mass that's half a kilogram lower than the true value, that's a systematic error. And you would solve that by just 
adding half a kilogram. Whereas a random error is where we have natural variation around the mean. So for instance, if we were timing humans doing anything, you're always going to have it being slightly longer and slightly shorter at different times. So what you need to do is collect a lot of data and calculate a mean. Then you might choose to have something to do with the actual topics that are going to be on this paper. So if you're taking combined science, that's forces, waves and electromagnetism. If you're taking GCSE physics, then you'll also have space. In terms of the forces topic, we might start off with scalars and vectors. So a scalar quantity is one that only has magnitude, like speed, whereas a vector quantity also has a direction, like velocity. We could also think about contact and non-contact forces. So a contact force is one that must be touching the object that we're exerting the force on. So that could be friction, air resistance, tension or normal contact force. And then a non-contact force doesn't have to be touching. Um, so that could be things like weight. Maybe in the past when doing the springs required practical, you've forgotten that it's extension we're interested in, not length, and you might need a reminder to calculate that by doing the final length to take away the starting length. Or maybe you've forgotten that that linear relationship only lasts as far as the limit of proportionality. You might need to write down the average speeds for walking and running and cycling. And then for unit six, we start with the electromagnetic spectrum. Maybe you know the song, but maybe it will be useful to have written down radio waves, microwaves, infrared radiation, visible light, ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays. All of those are examples of transverse waves, and it might be worth a little reminder to yourself that you're going to measure the wavelength from peak to peak or trough to trough, and the amplitude is half the height of the wave, not the full height. Once you've got that electromagnetic spectrum, you might want to remind yourself that it's the long wavelength waves which are used for communication and the short wavelength waves which are used for the medical applications. You might want to think about the required practical with the ripple tank and how in order to increase accuracy and precision, you're going to measure 10 waves and then divide the total length that you've measured by 10 when you're calculating the wavelength. And then for the electromagnetism um, unit, we've got another required practical. So you could think about the fact that to make your electromagnet stronger, you're going to increase the number of coils, increase the current and add an iron core to your solenoid. You might also want to do yourself a little sketch reminding yourself how the field lines go for um, the magnetic field of a bar magnet and this idea that they're going to go from north to south. So although our compasses point to the North Pole in inverted commas, the geographic North Pole is actually a magnetic South Pole. Then if you're doing the GCC physics, you've got the space topic and you might want some reminders in there about the life cycle of a star. So how we start with a nebula, that sort of big cloud of gas and dust. And from that, we form a protostar, which goes to a main sequence star. And then depending on the size, it could either become a red giant and a white dwarf and a black dwarf. Or if it's a lot bigger, it might be a red supergiant. And then we have a supernova and then a neutron star or a black hole. Now there's one other thing that I would recommend you do before you attack the rest of the paper, and that's find the six mark question. You may have more than one six mark question in your paper, but you will definitely have one because there is always one question that is common to the foundation tier and the higher tier. So if you're sitting foundation, it'll be question five, six or seven. And if you're sitting higher tier, it'll be question one, two or three. And it's going to be pitched at a grade four or five level. The reason I'd suggest finding that question nice and early is that you do get some credit for laying your ideas out in logical fashion and also because that piece of paper can be quite intimidating. So if you look at that question before you look at the rest of the paper, you can jot down any ideas you already have and make a little plan. And then as you're answering the rest of the paper, it'll be ticking away in the back of your brain. And if you think of anything else that's relevant, you can flick back to it and write it down. That means that by the time you actually come to write your answer, you've already got some ideas, you've already had a little bit of a think about how to structure them, and you're not just starting from absolute scratch. So let's say I read this question, and all I can think of is that I know that terminal velocity happens when the parachutist reaches their maximum speed and they're just not going to get any faster. So I can write down that the velocity is constant, it's unchanging. And then I go away and I do question one of the paper with that thought still ticking away in the back of my mind. 
And at the end of question one, I think to myself, well, the reason that the velocity isn't changing is because there's no resultant force. The forces are balanced. So I can flick back to my paper and say, OK, the forces are balanced. So then I go back and I do question two. And at the end of question two, I think to myself, ah, I should name those forces. So the forces are weight and the air resistance. So again, I can write those onto my question. And so by the time I get to question seven and I'm ready to actually answer it, I've got quite a few different points to include in my answer. And it's not nearly as intimidating. The one other thing I will mention is that you'll see around the outside of your paper, it, there's a black box and it says, don't write outside the box. Again, this is because your paper is going to be scanned. In reality, the vast majority of that space will actually make it onto the scan, but you just need to be aware that if you write something there, there's a chance your examiner might not pick up on it. So if you do, make sure you've done some sort of little arrow to say to them, look, there's something here that you need to look for. If you do find that particularly with the six mark question, you make a complete mess of it and you need to write somewhere else, don't just pick a random part of the paper to start writing in. Make sure that you either use the extra sheets at the back if there are there, or you ask one of the invigilators for a separate sheet. And then they will fill in a separate form to say that you use that sheet and your examiner will definitely get your work and you will definitely get credit. Thank you very much for watching. And I hope that you're now feeling slightly more prepared for your physics paper two examination. Good luck with the exam, and if you have found this useful, don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCC Physics videos coming soon.